Shalom, Purim Sameach, happy Purim to everybody. Everyone knows Purim is the happiest day of the year, and it's the highest day of the year, the light that shines, that realigns our relationship with God, is more pure and more real than on any other day of the year, even on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is thought to be the highest time of the year. It's only called Yom HaKippurim. It's like Purim. The light is similar. And what makes the joy on Purim so great? We've spoken about this so much. You know, obviously, the fact that Hashem's name is not mentioned in the Megillah, and we have to really look for Him, and all that stuff. But the fact is, the joy of Purim has to be real. It can't be based on just what... Some people think joy is just frivolity. It has to be real. I always thought that the take that a person has on Purim, the way we relate to Purim, is like a statement of how well adjusted a person is in this world to the human condition, to the existential dilemma of where we are, of always searching for Hashem in our lives, because that's what the story of Purim is really all about. And the story of Purim is a very personal story. We find ourselves there. We are Esther. We are Mordechai. We are the Jews of Shushan going through everything that, we went th that they went through, and we are looking for Hashem all around us. You know, the reality of our relationship with Hashem as it's reflected on Purim and how we react to Purim and how we, we navigate through this whole idea of, of the concealment and the masks and the identities and all the themes that are going on in the story of Purim reminds me very much of the statement that our sages make in the Talmud and Tractate Eruvun where they say, kind of like a play on words phonetically, Three words that sound like kiso, kaso, and koso. It's, our sages tell us that there are three ways in which a person is measured. Bikiso, bikaso, or bikoso. Bikiso through his pocket, how he gives charity, how he reacts when a person asks him to give charity. Bikaso, how easily he's angered, and bikoso, how he acts when he drinks. And the, those three things are a way of relating to how a person is really. And so is Purim, because Purim reveals what we really have inside of us. And it is a very personal story. And Megillat Esther is our story, each and every one of us. And you know, I have to tell you, Megillat Esther is so holy, and some people think, you know, it's the most inco inconsequential book of the Torah, they think, because Hashem's name is not even mentioned in it although it is very much so between the lines. And Megillat Esther is so deep, and the light that shines from it is the light of the rectified world. <clears throat> and you know, it's a very personal story, and the themes that we're dealing with here, the themes of concealment and revelation, the themes of Mordechai, the tzaddik, the leader, and Haman, the wicked one, and Amalek, and Esther, representing the Jewish people, these are recurrent themes in our lives. And the fact is, you know, like every other area of Torah, there is a great deal of detail regarding the halachot of how to fulfill the commandments of Purim. And everybody knows that on Purim we have a mitzvah to hear the entire Megillah. We go to the synagogue and someone reads the Megillah, the scroll of Esther, and every man, woman, and child has to hear every word. And the Mishnah discusses the rules relating to the reading of the Megillah. And it gives a case that says, if a person heard the Megillah out of sequence, out of order, you're not yotze. You don't fulfill the obligation of Purim if you don't hear the Megillah in order. Let's say someone started from the middle or something like that. You know, what does that really mean? There's a very beautiful insight from the Holy Rabbi Baruch of Mezhebaj, the grandchild of the Baal Shem Tov. He said, you know what it means to read the Megillah out of sequence? It means if a person would read Megillat Esther and just treat it like ancient history. If a person, he said, does not find contemporary relevance and the now in Megillat Esther, then you don't fulfill the commandment of Purim. It reminds us of that statement that we make on the Seder nights, that if a person doesn't view himself this night as if he personally was taken out of Egypt by God, he hasn't fulfilled the obligation of Pesach. So too, we see ourselves in Megillat Esther. And how does that work exactly? 
חיים. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם בורא פרי הגופן. You know, there is a tradition that our sages tell us that even though Hashem's name is not mentioned in the Megillah, Talmud tells us that every time the scroll of Esther uses the word Hamelech, without saying Hamelech Achashverosh, without saying the king Achashverosh, when it just says Hamelech, the king, it's actually an allusion to Hashem himself. And actually, this Megillah is written in a very beautiful style that the word Hamelech, the king, comes out at the top of every column. This is a way of adorning the commandment and making the scroll beautiful and also giving honor to the king of the universe, Hashem, whose name really is mentioned in the Megillah in a very discreet way. And, you know, Purim, our sages tell us that in the future, in the rectified world, and this is a difficult concept to understand, they tell us all of the holidays my harmonica fell, excuse me. They tell us, I almost spilled the wine all over my Megillah. They tell us, my papers are falling. They tell us that all of the holidays are going to be batel. They're going to be nullified, except for Purim. And they also tell us that all of the books of the Torah are going to be batel. They're going to be unnecessary, except for the scroll of Esther. And what does this mean? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that Hashem's name is not mentioned. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that it's such a personal story that we really are all in it and there's so much that we have to learn from it. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the light that shines on Purim is a refraction of the light of the rectified world that comes straight from the Holy Temple because Purim is the plural expression. There are two lots, there are two facets to the holiday. There's the facet that we're celebrating and there's also the facet that Hashem is celebrating, because the truth is that the intention of Haman and Achashverosh in destroying Israel was to make sure that the Holy Temple would never be rebuilt. And that was their entire goal. And that's why Achashverosh set himself up as the high priest of the other side. That's why he wore the garments of Aaron, because he wanted to take that power for himself. And Purim is really a celebration of the light that comes from the Holy Temple. And all the other holidays, you know, they are, kind of, they are kind of hinging on the idea of the remembrance of going out from Egypt. But the light of Purim is coming straight from the original light of creation as reflected in the Holy Temple. And you know, the truth is, there are so many levels of meaning in every area of the Torah. Every time we have one of the Chagim, one of the holidays, and we see ourselves there, and we want to take opportunity, we want to avail ourselves of the chance that the cycle of the seasons is giving us to get right with Hashem, to get right with ourselves. The story of Purim, the Megillah, is all about the Jews of Shushan, which is all of us, which is every human being getting right with themselves and gaining the confidence and realizing that whether or not we see Hashem's hand in our lives, it's always there. And therefore, it's my story, it's your story, it's the story of every person. And this whole idea of Hamelech, you know, the king, representing Hashem, His presence. It's very reminiscent of the, of the spirit and the feeling of the High Holy Days. And we said that Yom Kippur is really called Yom HaKippurim, the day which is like Purim. And that's also the emphasis during the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the emphasis is on Hashem, not as Kel, not as God, but as HaMelech, as the king. And just as when we read Megillat Esther, it's all about Hashem being king of the whole world. And you know, you go to the synagogue during the High Holy Days, and there's a, a tremendous, rarefied, intense atmosphere of this possibility of repentance and alignment. It's so portentous, and the feeling is so palpable of teshuva in the air on Yom Kippur. And the chazan, the, the, the reader of the prayer, the cantor, he starts the prayers in the morning with a very stirring melody steep from the soul, that tradition that's thousands of years old, and he starts to intone, And everyone 
and the room feels like the coronation of Hashem as the king, the Melech. And then he goes on to describe the king as sitting in his lofty throne. And that's really what the story of Purim is all about. It's about finding Hashem in the world and the, and the joy which is unspeakable because Hashem's name is unspeakable and His presence is unspeakable and the level that we can ascend to is unspeakable, uncommunicable, the level of understanding of our place in the world. It all comes from this story when Esther told Mordechai, you know, she's looking for Hashem. The Jewish people are looking for Hashem. Where are you? How many times do we feel this way? Do we say this in our own lives every day? It's only on Purim that we really understand where He is because we find ourselves and we're honest with ourselves and the, the masks really fall on Purim. That's why it's customary to put on a mask because the truth is that we have no masks on Purim and it's too overwhelming for a lot of people. But Esther is looking for Hashem and then we find that Mordechai tells her to go straight into the presence of the king and to entreat him to rescind the decree. And in chapter 4 and verse 11, Esther says, how could I do this? She looks at herself, she feels no confidence. She says, I haven't been called to the king for 30 days. How can I do this? The person feels, Hashem doesn't want to hear from me. He doesn't care about me. He hasn't called me by name. I haven't felt any sort of, any sort of presence in my life. I haven't felt called. I haven't felt you know, that personal connection. And that is all the work of Haman, as it were, what he stands for in this world. How amazing that we have a tradition that the Targum tells us on that very verse, on verse 11 of chapter 4. He tells us, you know what, the rule that no one was allowed, to read, that we read about there in verse 11, chapter 4, that we read about, that no one was allowed to go to the king unless he was called by invitation, that rule was enacted by Haman's instigation. It was all his idea. And that power which Haman represents, that power of, of self-doubt, and that wedge that he tries to, to drive between our Father in Heaven and all of us, it's his idea to make us weak and lack confidence and feel, who am I in Hashem's world? I'm nothing. How can I come before Him? And that is exactly what Esther's problem was, because we get so confused. The Megillah begins with the word Vayihi, and it came to pass, and it was, which contains some of the letters of Hashem's name. And the Zohar tells us that we become so confused and we feel so far from Hashem that we take the letters Yud, He, Vav, the first three letters of Hashem's name, and we turn them around, and it spells Hoi, Wo. And this is exactly what Haman is counting on and who is he after all? The Talmud tells us in Tractate Megillah, page 16a. Fine. We're starting early. The Talmud tells us he was a barber. He knew how to cut hair. He was a bathtub attendant. Bathhouse attendant. <laughs> Second. He wasn't an important person and he felt like he was nothing also. But he made a lot of pomp. He gave himself a lot of airs by associating with the Hashverosh. He was Ach to the Rosh. He was like the brother to that one who himself made himself very, very um, grandoise. Ahasuerus himself was an outsider. He bribed and bought his way to the throne. In fact, he wanted to sit on the throne of Shlomo HaMelech, of King Solomon, which was brought to exile, but the throne didn't allow him to sit on it. So he had an imitation made. There's a lot of imitators outside. They steal us blind. They're all out there. But the truth is that Haman is alluded to in the Torah. Where is Haman alluded to in the Torah? In chapter 3 of the book of Breshit, in verse 11, Hashem says to Adam, Hamin Ha'etz, did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And our sages quip that Haman, it's in tract at Hulun, that Haman took counsel from the tree of knowledge, from that desire that a person has for the fallen pleasures without elevating them to holiness. Because the Jewish people at the massive orgy of Ahasuerus with which the Megillah begins, they ate there. Even though Ahasuerus was 
serving food from the sacred vessels of the temple. The food was 100% kosher, but they forgot the connection to godliness. And this was the whole problem. You know, Esther lacked this confidence. We feel, how can we come to Hashem? You know why Purim is so happy? You know why it's so exciting? You know why it's a day unlike any other day when the message is of such camaraderie and unmitigated love and chesed? And we feel the presence of Hashem in the world so strongly on the day that we don't find Him. You know why? Wait, why? Oh, because Esther is all of us. And it was Mordechai the tzaddik, the righteous one, who th through the strength of the Torah and through the strength of the revelation of what prayer really is, was able to give her her confidence back. And this is what we find, that Esther is alluded to in the Torah. Our sages say, where is Esther alluded to in the Torah? It's in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 18, where Hashem says, on that day I will... I will Hastir, astir, it's a play on words, it's like Esther, I will surely hide my face. And it's an allusion to the period of time in ancient Persia, per, in ancient Persia when indeed Hashem seems to be hiding His face, but our sages tell us, you know what, it wasn't Hashem that was hiding it at all. It was we who were hiding. And another name for Mordechai is Petachia. Hashem opens up. Mordechai was able to bring the light of Hashem and open up for Esther confidence in herself. You know what? Haman complained to Ahasuerus. She said, there's one people. It's in, uh, it's in chapter uh, 3, verse 8 of the scroll of Esther. He said, there's one people, at least he called us Echad, divided and diffused. And he was counting on that, that the Jewish people would be divided amongst themselves and each one within himself also not feeling the sense of self. And that's what Purim brings us. So Esther was so alone, feeling that Hashem was hiding His face. And then we find a Midrash. And how do we understand the Midrash? It's so elusive. The Midrash tells us, it's in Breshit Rabbah. It says, one day, Mordechai couldn't find a wet nurse for Esther because, you know, he adopted her because her parents were gone. It says so in the Megillah. Couldn't find a, a wet nurse for her. So he nursed her himself. Now you could look at that very superficially and think that it's a fanciful tale that Mordechai, you know, grew a breast and nursed Esther. But that's not what it's telling us at all. Mordechai nurtured Esther in faith. He taught her how to believe. And more than anything, he taught her how to believe in herself. And that is what the story of Purim is really all about. And we find the verse that tells us in chapter 2 and verse 21, Kasher haita ba'amna ito that she, just as when she was reared by him, which also can be read as she was in confidence with him, as she had remained faithful to him, because he taught her to have faith. And that's why, in tracing the lineage of Mordechai, it tells us that there was a Jewish man, let's talk about all the papers, a Jewish man in Shushan. It says in chapter 2, and verse 5, There was a Jewish man in Shushan, the capital, and his name was Mordechai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimi, the son of Kish, a man of Benjamin. Well, if he was a man of Benjamin, he can't be a man of Yehuda, and he's called Ish Yehudi, a Jewish man. But if he's from Benjamin, then he's not from Yehuda. Our sages tell us, you know what? Anyone who publicly denies idolatry is called a Yehudi. A Jew. So he was a Benjaminite, but he was really a Yehudi. And he's called the son of Yair. That means to enlighten, because he enlightened our eyes. He's called the son of Shimi. That means to hear, because he taught us how Hashem hearkens to prayer. And he's called the son of Kish, which is actually related to the word to knock on the door, because he taught us to knock on heaven's door. And he was a Yehudi because he confronted idolatry and stood up to it because Haman had his God woven into his robe and everybody was bowing down to him and therefore bowing down to his God. And this is the problem that many times we bow down to Haman's robe. We've already taught that Hashem's presence is cloaked in this world, it's in a garment. And sometimes we lose sight of Hashem's orchestration and we think that the thing itself is What's running things? It's the robe, it's the cloak, and people are bowing down to Haman's robe. And Mordechai stood up and he said, no, 
it's only Hashem, and Hashem is the only one that we bow down to. And Mordechai, by, by bowing down to Hashem, by bowing down to Hashem and not to Haman, actually rectify the bowing down of Yaakov to Esav. And you know that the Midrash tells us that originally Haman only wanted to kill Mordechai, then he wanted to kill all the rabbis, and then he decided, no, I have to kill all the Jewish people. That's because he realized that the help of, of the Jewish people is going to come from a leader. So he wanted to kill Mordechai. Then he said, but wait a minute, as long as the rabbis are here, then someone will teach them Torah, so I have to kill them also. But then he realized, wait a minute, the problem is the Jewish people themselves, because every single one of them is connected to God. Every single one of them can be a tzaddik. Everything, every single one of them can become Mordechai. I have to kill all of them. Because as long as they're in the world, I will not be able to accomplish what I want to be accomplished, which is to be God himself. And the truth is that the story of Purim is our own personal story that goes on within the world, that goes on between Amalek and Israel, that goes on within Israel, that goes on within every one of ourselves. It's a challenge to realize our godly soul, how connected we are with Hashem, whether we see it every day or not. It's a very, very personal story. And the joy, the palpable joy, the unspeakable joy of Purim is that on this one day, at least on this one day, the masks are off and there are no more pretenses. And we realize no matter what and no matter how it looks that Hamelech is on the top of every page, we will not bow down to the robes of Haman. We find him in our lives. And that is the joy of Purim, to realize this light of our relationship is truly a reflection of the rectified world. Purim Sameach to everyone. Light to the Nations is produced by the Temple Institute in the Marty Morrill Studios in Jerusalem, Israel. Dedications can be made for upcoming Light to the Nations teachings. To make a dedication, please visit templeinstitute.org, go to the multimedia section, and click on Light to the Nations. Or you can email media at templeinstitute.org. Your dedications help make these productions possible.